And the one thing that surprises me is so many of them are nervous to get started because they feel right. like they don't know enough. Right. And to me, it's almost like, dude, you're a canvas. Like, you don't right. need to know enough. You just need to start painting. Jordan, what's happening, man? How you feeling? I'm good, Sam. What's up with you, brother? Yeah, we're chilling. Getting real chilly out here in Wyoming. Yeah, but uh, who we got? Who we got? December, <laughs> baby. Uh, what's uh, who we got lined up today? Uh, today we have Chris Maltese, like the dog. He said, "Like the dog." It's just, that's my dog, oh, Chris. Dog. That's my um, dog. Chris Maltese is the current <laughs> head of Artist Services U.S. under the TuneCore Believe umbrella. So. Uh, in this episode, we talk about his experience in, in uh, media from his time at MTV, uh, in management and publishing from his time at Primary Wave, and we get really deep into what he's doing now, which is running a new record label division. Um, the first label, Pivotal Projects, we get into. Um, we get into, you know, he started it in 2020 in March and how that's uh, made him pivot kind of his strategy. We also discuss a uh, very high level what it's like to build that strategy uh, from the ground up at a record label. Um, and, you know, I'm excited for people to hear this because I generally like discussing multiple facets of someone's career. I think it gives not just context on the person, um, but it, it allows people to understand the different ways that they can go in their career and where they can end up from uh, the path that they started. And I think we illustrate that really well with Chris. Um, you know, he started at MTV, kind of getting an idea of what it was like to see artists in their teams um, and then ended up leading leading a few teams himself. So a uh, super interesting guy. Definitely glad we got to, to to interview him. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, I think he was able to speak really well to the shifting role of a record label, um, given his experience working on both sides of the table as a manager for a bunch of really incredible acts, as well as running and operating different record labels. He's able to dive into how to position yourself and build some of that early stage traction so that way you can get a favorable record deal. And then also dives into, okay, yeah, once you have a deal, how, how do you really ensure that you're getting and, and getting the most out of that partnership with the record label? So lots of gems in this episode. Uh, one last thing before we do dive into the show. I'm not sure if you guys heard our, our past episode that we did with Dan, Dan Runcy, who runs the Trapital podcast and the Trapital newsletter and media brand. Um, but did just want to pay homage, a little, little uh, virtual hat tip for the Trapital Podcast. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to check it out. Trapital Podcast is the, the home for the business of hip hop. Um, they've had some incredible interviews on their show, including people like Steve Stout and other folks behind the scenes who really make the culture work. I, I think Dan brings a, a really analytical lens to different things that are happening in the music industry and in the hip hop world. So I, I think... Uh, we, we know you guys love to listen to podcasts, hence why you're tuned in with us today. So I want to encourage you guys to check it out and give it a listen. Um, but without any further ado, let's get into this week's uh, episode with Mr. Chris Maltese. Chris, man, how's it going? Thanks for uh, thanks for virtually coming out. Hey, I'm, I'm glad to virtually be here. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and, you know, I always think it's really interesting when we're all in different places uh, during interviews. So I just want to, you know, Shout out to Wyoming, New York, and New Jersey, all in the building. There you go. It's the trifecta. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so the I guess to like <laughs> Wyoming leg of the, of the tripod. <laughs> Yo, that's what it is, right? It's New York, New, it's New York, New Jersey, and Wyoming. That's what, that's what it is. Sam, Sam is breathing better than all of us, for that's sure. Yeah, it is. <laughs> exactly. Um, cool. So I guess just to get started, we obviously have a good amount of people that listen to this podcast that are um, entering the music industry or trying to find yeah. their way into it. Um, so can you kind of just say what was your first big break when you first entered the music industry and kind of how it came to be? Yeah, my first big break, well, it's interesting because it kind of wasn't even really in the music industry, but I, I spent uh, about eight years working for MTV and kind of like in their heyday-ish period. But about mm. halfway through there, I kind of started to realize like, you know, it's a cool job for a young guy. I was spending a lot of my time interviewing, you know, all these major celebrities, the biggest artists in the world, big actors. Um, I started to realize I kind of wanted to be on this, that side of the business. You know, like they would come in with these entourages mm -hmm. and I would start to figure out, okay, that's the label rep. Okay, that's that's the manager. That's the tour manager. That's the publicist. Like I kind of started to put my my uh, my hat on of, of figuring out who is who. And then, 
you know, how do I get onto that side? So um, about halfway through there, I started to uh, to think about, you know, signing artists and, and, you know, wanting to work with them, maybe from a management standpoint. I didn't really know what managers did. Um, so I basically just kind of asked myself the question, like, if I was going to help an artist today, where's my value? What, what do I have to give an artist right now? And at that time, I was in this epicenter of pop culture at, at MTV. So what I did was I basically started to get my friends who were artists, like, you know, the, some of my friends had bands or were, were trying to do the artist thing. I started getting their songs onto the MTV shows. And what happened was, you know, yeah, at that best time, friend ever, man. Dang. yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you like, remember you too, MTV? you know, if you remember too, like MTV, and I, I think they actually still do this, they would Chiron the song, which basically means you show the, the artist's name and the song title right. in the show while the song is playing. Mm -hmm. So I had friends that like never performed out live before. Now they have their song on like the season finale of Laguna Beach, which turned into the hills. That's wild. And, you know, they uh, what happened was they started getting phone calls from record labels and managers and lawyers and publishers and not know how to handle that. So they would call me back and say, hey, you got th that song on that show for me. Can you call this guy back and see what he wants? Or can you come with me to this meeting and like, you know, ask him, you know, what, what kind of a deal we can get? So like, mm -hmm. I kind of inadvertently fell into management without really knowing what I was doing. Um, and then coincidentally, I, I convinced an artist that I found on MySpace to let me manage him. I reached out to him really just to see if I could play some of his songs onto MTV shows, which wasn't my job, by the way. I was just kind of side hustling. Um, and we got to know each other and, and I did end up signing him for management. And for whatever reason, I just believed in this artist so much that I convinced him and really myself that, you know, we could go to number one on MySpace, you know, do a showcase for all the labels in New York and one in LA, then get a record deal, then have a big hit and then tour the world and, and, and do a big publishing deal and everything's going to be great. And I was naive enough to think that that could actually happen. Um, but it did. That's exactly what happened. So uh, I signed to this kid, Secondhand Serenade, and he was uh, the first artist on the Glass Note Records. We wound up with the top five pop hit. You know, when that happened, uh, signed a big publishing deal and I left MTV. So he said the rest is history. The bag, yeah. was, the, the bag was secured, you know? <laughs> the, the, the bag um, was secure, but there was still a lot more work to go. Right. But that, that was really my introduction into, you know, the music industry was was essentially to just jump into the deep end. You know what I mean? I really didn't have any experience. Yeah, I actually appreciate you saying that too and that that's your story because I think when a lot of people reach out to, to us, uh, at least I know for myself, they kind of ask me how to get there, how, how, to, how to enter the music industry and um, do they have to start with internships? Uh, what does the path look like? You know, doing an internship is just one route, but obviously if there's, if there's artists that you know, friends that you know, artists in your community, you don't have to wait for someone at an internship or someone at a major company to tell you that you can be a manager. You can, you can call up your best friend tomorrow. You can call up your homie tomorrow who, did, who raps. And if you really believe in them, that could be your first, that could be the first artist that you work for. A lot of the artists, a lot of the artist 100%. managers, I mean, that I, that, that I look up to had no experience in management before they started. Um, it was, it was all, you know, yeah. I met somebody, I really believed in them and I just tried to try to do it. Um, and I honestly think, management is such an experienced based business that you know internships obviously can help you but the sooner you kind of like throw yourself into the fire um and be okay with making mistakes i think is is uh is 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 the way to go as long as you're not you know ruining people's careers and things like that but you know yeah a hundred percent and and you said it really well too like management is such a uh experience based career you can't go to school to learn how to be a manager, just like you can't right. go to school to learn how to be an artist, right? And right. both of them are art forms. They're very different art forms, but they are 100% art forms. Right. So you're right. Like you really can't, you really can't learn it unless you experience it. And I think, again, like I, at the time, I was just naive enough to, to dream big, you know? Um, I, I, I happened to get uh, fairly close to, to a, a popular DJ at the time named DJ AM. Um, and you know, he had told me that the best piece of advice he ever got was from his mom who said, if you can find something that you love to do, you know, for no money, figure out how to make money on it and you'll never work a day in your life. And right. I've heard that saying a million times since, but at the time it really stuck with me. 
So, you know, for me, once I got the bug of management and I, and I kind of got the, the bug of like, oh, this is what I want to do. And this is where I want to go, at least for the moment, I went full force. Like it was, it was, nobody could tell me no, you know what I mean? Like I knew right. that I didn't know everything, but nobody could tell me no. And to your point too, like I get, I get hit up a lot from like, you know, there's like college kids that hit me on LinkedIn and, you know, want to get on the phone and just kind of hear like, how did you get started? Same thing. And the one thing that surprises me is so many of them are nervous to get started because they feel right. like they don't know enough. Right. And to me, it's almost like, dude, you're a canvas. Like you don't right. need to know enough. You just need to start painting. You know what right. I mean? Like let your story play itself out. I, I know for me, you know, the reason why I am where I am today is because of all of the experience that I have, but both on the wins and the losses. Like I really needed to have both of those in order to, you know, experience enough to be able to be in a position now where I can, you know, run a, di a division of record labels. Right. Absolutely. Which leads me exactly uh, right to my next question, which is what is uh, the way it up. Day work go. that you do right now? Yeah. So right now um, I am blessed to be in a position where uh, I work for both TuneCore and Believe. Um, TuneCore, uh, as, as you know, a lot of people know, is, is a, a very large distributor. Uh, originally based here, here in the United States. Um, they're the only distributor to give a hundred percent of, uh, the money made to artists. They don't use any third parties like a lot of other, you know, distributors do. So they actually get a hundred percent of a hundred percent. So it's a very artist friendly company. Um, mm -hmm. that was a, a, a draw for me and I used to encore, you know, while I was a manager. So, um, I'm blessed to be there. TuneCore is owned by a company called Believe, which a lot of people here in the States don't necessarily know much about, but Believe is massive. Um, they've got, you know, over 1,200 employees. They're, they're set up in 45 countries. Um, so they're a massive, massive distribution service running at a very high level based in, uh, in Paris. Their headquarters are in Paris. Uh, but what they did a few years ago is they started to put together these label divisions they call artist services. Um, it's really the services of labels for mm -hmm. artists. So right. what we do, and then, you know, they started putting them in, in various countries. So I head up the U.S. for the label division of Believe. And basically, we don't own any masters. So again, very artist friendly. But we treat our business um, not just as distributors, but closer to what, you know, you would, you would expect at a major label. So we have a high level of funding. We have uh, a team here in the States. We have a team in Paris. We have, a, there's a team just like mine in Mexico, in Italy, in China, mm -hmm. in Russia, in Australia. So, you know, we could also take a very global approach. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, for, for lack of a better term, I'm running a division, which will, uh, over the course of time, you know, over the next few years, start to roll out genre-based labels. Uh, we started with one in the hip hop and R and B space called Pivotal Projects, which we launched in March, and then about four days later, we're, we were working from home. So, I was about to say, the, uh, hell of a timing there. <laughs> I mean, we literally went to press and we saw what was about to happen, and we kind of pulled back. So we never really did like a proper. <laughs> we're here, so a lot of people don't know that we exist yet, but. Um, yeah, strange times. But that being said, yeah, we started with Pivotal Projects, which is our, our hip hop and R and B focused label. You know, and then and then moving into to next year, we're now, you know, putting place pieces in place to start a pop one, a dance one, and right. you know, so on and so forth as time goes on. But each one of them will have its own name, you know, staff, it really its own culture. The point is is that we wanna we wanna be in a position in a few years from now where, you know, not only can we say we have you know, the top distribution service in the world with Believe. Sitting on top of that, we're the only ones here in America with this portfolio of genre-based labels. So no matter right. what kind of an artist you are, if we're going to sign you, uh, we're going to bring you into an actual culture where the staff really knows that lane, has the relationships, and can really move the ball down the field. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that. So I, I know... Um... I mean, it's interesting how record labels have been forced to evolve and kind of restructure. And I think we're seeing awesome innovative models where kind of a company that starts as a distributor or is operating as a distributor is starting to operate like a label for certain artists. From your perspective, can you define the most important elements of a modern day record label? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, a modern day record label is is far beyond just distribution 
Um, and yet at the same time, I, I think it's so, it's so, um, it's so different from label to label. Like if you look at the culture of, of certain labels, they really vary, um, you know, on what they feel like is important, um, how they treat their artists and the type of deals they offer, how they treat their staff. Um, you know, I think the modern day record label is one that can stay nimble. Um, you know, obviously the industry keeps on changing, right? So we're, we, we, we've seen, uh, the formats change, you know, obviously streaming is here. Um, you know, hip hop and, and R and B tend to be streaming better than, you know, hard rock or, or, you know, whatever. So you can see where like the divide is going and people are trying to follow different trends. I just think a modern day, uh, record label is, is one that, um, you know, can stay nimble that is also very artist friendly. If you, if you've noticed the tide is definitely turning and artists are talking a lot more now about ownership, that's not by accident. Um, we believe artists should own their art. Um, so, you know, I think that that conversation is definitely changing things. Uh, Everyone's hearing about these deals now that are, that are being offered where, you know, the labels are not, uh, are not offering masters and, most of them don't want to put those deals forward, but they kind of have to to stay competitive. So I think you've got to be able to bring a really good balance of marketing. Um, I think you've got to be able to think outside of the box, especially in the situation that we are right now um, with this pandemic. Um, and I think you've got to be able to to have a you know a strong global network for your distribution and for any activity that's going on, both internationally and domestically. Right. Right. Um- Speaking of modern day record label, I think, you know, a lot of a lot of what kind of constructs a modern day record label often comes from people with a management background, Um, just because people in management, I think, have just had to deal with so many different things. I think they they kind of come with a with a mindset a little more open minded uh, towards artists and uh, their qualms and their business strategies and that sort of thing. So what's a few things that you feel like you've learned, uh, you know, as a manager that really benefits you now, um, you know, as a, as a, as a label division owner, um, and what are some examples of, you know, those things that you learned in your management experience, I guess. So, you know, what, what are the lessons and when did you learn them as a, as a manager and how they kind of apply to to what you're doing now? Yeah. I mean, I'll take it a step further because, you know, like I said, I started in media, right. I was at MTV interviewing artists. Um, then I went into, and, and I started doing some licensing as a, uh, my side hustle. Then I went into management. Um, after I had my own, my own shop for a while, I partnered with a, a company called primary wave, which is, mm-hmm. you know, more so known for being a, a big publisher. Um, mm-hmm. so I worked on the publishing side. Um, you know, I started an in-house label there. I'm now running a mm-hmm. division of, of, of label. So, you know, the, uh, the broad spectrum has, has taught me a lot. I've gotten, I've gotten to see, um, pretty much every aspect of the business, whether it's again, media management, publishing label. Um, so out of all of that though, I will say that like, there's a few really key, key lessons to be learned. The main one though, is that, you know, artists are unique people. Um, artists feel things more maybe than, than some, um, (laughs) <laughs> and everyone that's working in the industry are human beings. And mm-hmm. I think that a lot of times we, we forget that, you know, from a fan perspective, it might be hard to, to grasp. But all of the, the work that's being done uh, behind the scenes, all of the passion and the energy that goes into creating music and creating art. I mean, these are coming from human beings. So I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is that you know, no one's perfect. You're never going to, you're never going to hit all home runs. You're going to have losses, but at the same time, you've just got to, you got to really work and concentrate on being a good person. I've definitely learned that the people that I have worked with or been around, uh, in a work environment, uh, from an artist perspective, the ones that are gracious, the ones that walk in the room and, and, you know, with a smile, the ones that have positive attitudes, the one that thank you when they leave, uh, shake your hand, those are generally the ones that people will fight for. You know what I mean? That mm-hmm. people will go the extra mile for. So I, I always try to tell artists like, look, I don't care how big you get. <laughs> be a good person. You know what I mean? Be, right. be thankful. Um, you get to you get to 
share your art with the world for a living. Be gracious. You know what I'm saying? So that that's a big one. And, and then really the other one that I think has to be mentioned, and I know it's been talked about a million times, but work ethic is so detrimental to probably to every business, but in this business, especially there are a million and one artists out there trying to make it. And me starting at MTV and, and, you know, interviewing the top of the top, I learned very early what work ethic was like, right. I sat in a room with Diddy while he, you know, went, that's went, Mr. Work ethic. You know what I'm saying? And like gave out his orders and then checked his email and then got on the phone and then did the interview and made sure he looked at everybody's eyes and smiled and thanked everybody and, and then got right back on the phone and then was given. So like, I, I, I've always saw like, again, from the top down, of, 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 it was really the people that always like worked the hardest mm-hmm. that I feel like kind of got ahead. And, and I know artists today that I love that I think are great artists, but, you know, just don't really have that fire in them. Right. Um, and, and, and I think that that's probably also the same in the executive world or, you know, in, in, in most businesses, it's, it's, it's the work ethic that really, I think, separates the good from the great. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And I think it's such a foundational principle that a lot of people often overlook. But um, one thing, and I mean, it, what's fascinating is given your experience as a manager, working with artists, as well as running and operating multiple labels, um, this is kind of a two-part question. Part one is really how, what are areas where you feel artists should really put their focus in those early stages where they want to get and set themselves up to get a favorable record label deal? So we'll start there and, and kind of circle back to part two. Sure. Um, well, I can tell you this. The the weight of that question is a lot heavier today, given the pandemic that we're in, where you don't have as many opportunities. You can't walk in and do the handshakes with press and get to know radio programmers. And a lot of the, thi- a lot of the steps that you would have normally taken before, um, you can't take. So... You know, given that companies, record companies, publishers, everybody, we're, we're depending a little bit more on data. So your numbers are important. And anyone who thinks that I can just create a hot song and put it out there and I'm worthy of a million dollars, it's like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, I can show you. I have a, we have an internal system that we use for, you know, calculating our, uh, our projections. And I can tell, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm putting together an offer for, um, a seven year deal, I can actually look and see how much am I projected to make in March of year five. Boom. There it is. You know what I'm saying? So like we know to a science, um, what artists are really worth. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a little bit, uh, you know, of a misconception from sometimes from the artist side and manager side, that being said, you should concentrate on your numbers and you should concentrate on your streaming. You should concentrate on your socials. Um, but the biggest thing, you know, you you mentioned when you're first starting out, you want to talk about, about, uh, jewels. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a jewel right here. This is going to be one of your sound bites. When, (laughs) when, when I started with secondhand serenade, I don't want to say it was 24 hours around the clock, but it was close. We had set it up so that again, on MySpace, you know, you could, you could message the person and they can message you back. We had it set up that we were talking to the fans almost on a 24 hour basis. So he was on the West coast. I was on the East coast. You know, I knew enough about his, the way he responds and you know, uh, how he wants to, to, uh, project himself. So one of the two of us was almost always online talking to the fans, mm. the hand to hand combat when you're first starting out is so detrimentally important because think about it this way. If you, I don't know who your favorite artist is, but let's say your fa- your favorite artist is Tyga, right? You if you DM'd Tyga and he actually DM'd you back, you would be like, "Oh my god, he hit me back!" Like I love <laughs> this guy. Like you're a lifer. That's it. You are a lifer now. So mm-hmm. when you create that one on one connection with a fan, you turn that one person into a lifer. If you grow an army of lifers, it's the greatest staff you can ever have. Because those are the people that are going to go out there and bring more and more and more. Right. So, yeah, I would say when you're first starting out, when you don't have big budgets to spend, when you don't have a label, you might not even have a manager yet. It's so important for you to schedule time every single day and talk to your fans, even on a one-on-one basis. 
just open up to them, get to know them, ask them about their day, ask them to do things for you. It's, you'd be amazed how many, how many times you can, you'd, you'd ask a, a fan to say, Hey, would you mind just, you know, uh, uh, streaming my song a few times today? And they'll do it. You know what I mean? Just cause you asked. So yeah, if, if there's one takeaway, um, for, for the, I'm just starting out as an artist and I don't really know what to do. I promise you, if you spend the time creating uh, an army of lifers, those people are going to be with you forever. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think that's something we think about a lot is that there's, there's a difference between like a fan and a super fan. And to the extent you could really nurture that relationship, all the, all digital marketing and modern media buys aside, you're never going to trump word of mouth. Yeah. But that, you know, you bring up a good point about that too, because a lot of people are like, yeah, but my song is moving. I don't need to do that. But the reality is there's a really numbers, bro. Yeah, but here's, <laughs> so here's here's the big difference with that. Here's and a lot of artists don't understand this. There is a major difference between being a fan of a song and being a fan of an artist. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're a fan of an artist, that artist could put out an album of sneezes and you're gonna support it. If you're right. a fan of a song, <laughs> once the song is over, it's on to the next. Yeah. So your job as an artist is to not only create songs that people are into, but to also create fans for yourself as a, as a person, as an artist. So however that may be, it may be very, you know, not everybody wants to just let the whole world in and that's okay. But you still have to understand the difference between being a fan and uh, of a song and being a fan of an artist because they are wildly different. Right. Yeah. A thousand percent. All right. So on to part two. We, we use Chris's tactics, get that fresh deal with Pivotal. Um, <laughs> as, as having operated on both sides of the table from a manager and label side, um, yep. whether you're an artist or a manager, how can you make sure that you're getting the most out of your partnership with a record label? Good, great question. Um, for, for one, the best thing you can do is have a manager, you know, a capable manager. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that an artist doesn't necessarily want to have conversations about, whether that's money, whether that's marketing, whether that's, uh, you know, pushing back a release, whatever the, whatever the case may be, it's always good to have a manager to, uh, simply as a buffer, uh, to, you know, in between you and your record label, but more specifically and much more importantly, a manager is going to allow you, a good manager is going to allow you to concentrate on your art your manager mm -hmm. is going to open up doors that you can't open yourself or don't want to knock on um, a manager is going to provide opportunities for you they're going to spend their day you know um creating the, the 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 frame of your business whereas you can concentrate on your art so i've had uh you know we, we we've dealt with with artists that don't have management and, and don't have that structure around them and what they're capable of, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis is just, it's, it, it's different. You know what I mean? It's, it, it really works to uh, an artist's favor to, to have a good manager and have someone in place that, you know, you can build your business with and not take on everything on your own. Uh, it's really hard uh, as an artist to do that. So, so that's, that's one. Um, number two, you also want to have transparency. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, regardless of where you do your deal, like, okay, so we're talking about pivotal projects. When you, when you do a deal with pivotal projects, number one, you know exactly what your budgets are for, for marketing, for videos, mm -hmm. you know, what your advances, all of that. But more specifically, the way that we operate, we do your whole marketing plan and then we present it to you. And, and, you know, we ask like, what do you think about this? You want to take this off, but maybe we'll right. do this or what ideas do you have? Or, right. you know, so, so at the end of that conversation, we have a very clear plan on paper, what our plan of actions are, how much each of those things are going to cost us, what the timeline is going to be. And both parties basically sign off on that. And then we move forward. So we at Pivotal Projects, we don't spend any of your marketing budget unless you've approved it uh, in writing. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're really specific with that. And then on the flip side, you know, we also have a system in place where we have these, what we call a running financial form. So any artist that we have or manager can log in 24 hours a day and see, okay, here's where my marketing budget started for this album. Here's all the things that we've spent on so far. Here's when I approved those things. And here's where I'm at today. Here's what's left. So every single penny is accounted for. You know, transparency happens to be a big issue within our industry that I think a lot of artists are having 
trouble with in a lot of places. So we, mm-hmm. we've really tried to, to go above and beyond and make it um, something that's a bit of a priority for us, not just the Pivotal Projects, but Believe Globally is very, very big on, on transparency. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, which kind of brings me to my next point, which is, uh, you know, you started a label in, in 2020. We talked about the impeccable timing of that um, a little bit earlier. But what are the, generally the, the first few orders of business? I know we talked about, you know, being a great partner to an artist um, from a label perspective and being a great partner to a label from an artist perspective. But, but when you start a, a, a label like Pivotal, what are some of the what are some of the things that you uh, figure out before you even launch? Like, what are some of the things that are kind of going through your head? Like, okay, you kind of want to start a record label. And I asked because, you know, with, with, you know, with companies like TuneCore, um, a lot of people can distribute music on their own. Um, and you're seeing a lot of these like indie labels pop up uh, all over the place. And obviously there are ones that are umbrellaed, there are ones that aren't umbrellaed, but I do know a good amount of people, even in New York, um, that release their friends' music and start off releasing their friends' music and kind of operate under this uh, very small label, um, very niche or a local label. Um, so before you even kind of start that process of the process of releasing music, you know, you're bringing a lot of what you're saying right now. Um, you're, you're, you're saying a lot of the values of, of Pivotal Projects. How, what's the process of kind of, um, you know, building a label and, and how do you how do you come up with those, how do you come up with those values and and that value proposition to the artists and, and strategy and, you know, at a, I guess at a high level, like what does the beginning of that process look like? Right. Uh, great questions too. So, you know, again, I, I was kind of blessed when I came into this position to be part of both TuneCore and Believe because both of them are so deeply rooted in, uh, you know, treating an artist right. Um, yeah. That's why, again, we don't own any masters. That's why everything is transparent. Um, it's also the reason why, you know, TuneCore is really the only one that can say they 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 paid out $2 billion to artists as of uh, October of 2020, the first ones to hit that. So, you know, um, I, I've been in a fortunate position where I'm in a very artist-friendly uh, company. Um, that being said, I mean, once, you know, one, on day one, you're, you're essentially trying to figure out, okay, well, what is the long-term strategy? Mm-hmm. And then how do we work backwards mm-hmm. to get there? And I think that that's really the case for everything, you know, a, a record release, um, uh, a full on record deal where there's going to be multiple projects. It's all about like, what's the end goal? And then how do you work backwards? You know, what steps you have to take to get there? So the very first one for us was really figuring out what the strategy was going to be. How are we going to separate ourselves from the market? The way that we, you know, came up with that was, okay, well, we know how a lot of these other companies are just kind of out there signing any and everything. Cause they, again, they're monetizing their distribution fee. We can right. be different because we can segment it out, take our time, segment it out by genre. So it's really, we're really kind of specialists in each of these areas. And that will breed a culture where the artist, you know, as, 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 to give you an example, as a manager, I would talk all the time to other artists and be like, you know, how is it going over at whatever distributor, ser- distributor with services that you have your deal at? And I would usually hear one of two things. One was either, you know, they sold me on a whole bunch of stuff that I kind of didn't get. Or two was, you know, well, I got a few bucks out of it, but I have to do it all myself. So we right. wanted to really kind of separate ourselves by saying, let's separate it into genres, but let's also keep our rosters really manageable and maintainable so that we can actually focus on each one of the artists and never shelf an artist, right? So instead mm-hmm. of going out there and over signing and under delivering, we're going to flip that around and we're going to focus on a specific smaller group of artists for each label. So with Pivotal Projects, you know, we launched in March, like I said, we signed six artists and it's not because we couldn't sign 60 or 600. Right. We chose to sign six. And the reason why we called it Pivotal Projects was because every one of their, every project that we take on is pivotal to our success and vice versa. We're going to be hands-on. We're going to make a real impact. We're not just going to take things on just to put out the records and collect. Um, so, you know, that's, that was kind of a big, a big separator strategy was the first step. Once you have the strategy, it's okay. Well, how do we fill the, the seats with the right team members to fulfill that strategy? So once right. we knew we were going to start in the, you know, hip hop and R and B space, you know, then it was like, okay, well, let's bring in some specialists from that space. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, our head of marketing, she came from, from Def Jam. 
our, our head of uh, digital strategy, Eric Petty, who, you know, he, he was over at Cash Money and Republic for a long time, you know, getting the Drake's and Nicky's playlisted. Uh, now he's at Pivotal Projects. Um, we pulled, you know, pulled in a couple of A&Rs. We have a project manager from Capital. Um, you know, we have a head of sync out in LA. So we, we kind of just put together this mini all-star roster for the staff that really knows that world. Right. And again, as we move forward, we're going to, you know, replicate those steps. But yeah, it was, it was, it's really all about first getting your strategy in place, second, getting the right team in place. And then third is obviously, you know, going out there and bringing the right artist into the fold. Right. Right. That's awesome. And, and, uh, sorry, no, go ahead. Sammy, good. <laughs> um, when it comes We're just to so like, excited to talk to you, Chris. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> Man, let's go. <laughs> um, when it comes, one thing that interests me too is like it, in the same way that obviously the music industry has had drastic change uh, as far as not only the role of a record label but how artists are developed and promoted. Um, like it only continues to change and evolve. So when you're thinking about like staffing strategy, like what do you feel are some of the like most important roles, and how do you anticipate that changing in the coming years? Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, I think every role is important, right? Because, because everybody is playing a different, uh, a, a different part or of, of a collective unit and you need all of those parts, um, you know, to prioritize them is a little bit tough because one person might, might feel like, you know, uh, you know, my project manager is the one I speak to every single day. I need that person to be rock solid. Whereas mm -hmm. somebody else might be like, all I care about right now is playlisting. Get me the, the digital yeah. strategy guy. And somebody else might be like, I already got all my relationships to the DSPs. I really need some creative marketing ideas. So mm -hmm. give me the best marketing person. So, you know, I don't know that I would, I would prioritize any one over the other, but I will say that, you know, when I was kind of interviewing the candidates for each position, there was, there were a few characteristics that I always looked for. And one question I always asked was, um, you know, it sounds so typical and, and, and bear with me because it's, it, you'll see where I'm going. But I did, uh, I did ask that totally typical question of like, well, where do you see yourself in, you know, five years or 10 years? Anybody who said to me, this position, this one that I'm interviewing for, this is my, this is where I, this is where I want to be. Like, this is my dream job. Anybody who had an answer like that was, I almost immediately crossed them off the list. For mm -hmm. me, I want to surround myself with people who want to take over the world. Because right. I want to take over the world. So I know when you get that like-minded group of people together who are all aspiring to take over the world, whatever that means to them, you know, that's what I, that's what I want is that, is that tenacity and that passion. Um, this, this industry is so fueled on passion. And I know, you know, from, again, the years of experience in, in management and publishing, it takes going the extra mile to really break an artist. And when you're really passionate about an artist, you're going to go the extra mile. When you're not, or when they're not friendly, or when they won't go the extra mile themselves, you won't, and you'll pull back. So I really look at passion as a as a very big uh, indicator on on you know how somebody's work ethic is going to be. So when I, when we do bring into in you know into our A and R meetings, which or, or company meetings where everybody is there, um, I really want to have the sign off from everybody in the room, if we're going to go after someone, there's a few right. people that are like, nah, I'm not into this. Then that's a big red flag for me. So again, part of the reason why we've stayed pretty small is because we want to make sure that, you know, we're really bringing in the artists that we're super passionate about because it, it is going to take on the extra mile. Right. Right. That's awesome. So when it comes to, um, in your experience when it, in growing and developing artists, um, can you speak through just one story or maybe two of, of like specific artists you've worked with and a couple, I mean, just kind of putting it on a bit of a storyline from like emerging and what have been some of the breaking points and like getting really specific would be amazing. Who the artist is, what were those big inflection points? Yeah, for sure. Um, I can give you one, which, uh, you know, Chris Cab is an artist that I worked with for a long time who, um, you know, I was introduced to him by his, uh, his booking agent over at Paradigm. Um, and when I met him, he, he was already signed, uh, over at Island records or at the time it was actually Island Def Jam. Um, but, and he, you know, he had had uh, a little bit of buzz going already. He had had some success with, um, you know, he, he was really tight with Wyclef. He was, he was tight with Pharrell. He was kind of like a Pharrell protege. 
Um, so when I stepped in, they were, he was still kind of working on a new project. Um, that project was an album, which, you know, definitely was a highlight of my career because, um, Pharrell was featured on a song that uh, he, he also produced um, of Chris's that, you know, we couldn't really get much happening here in the States. But for whatever reason, we put the video out, shot a beautiful video, uh, put the video out. And we noticed that there was a lot of streams coming in specifically from the Netherlands. And we were like, what, why? You know, we couldn't really put our finger as to why that was. Um, but what we did know was, you know, things aren't moving like that here in America today. Mm -hmm. So instead of being stagnant about it, we read the data and this was probably the first time, well, one, one of the first times in my career where, you know, I really leaned heavily on the data to, to, to see, uh, kind of the bigger picture. So we basically talked about it and we're like, you know what, whatever's happening in, in the Netherlands is happening and it's not happening here right now. Let's mm -hmm. go to the Netherlands. So we went to Amsterdam, booked a show, and he sold out. I mean, it wasn't a massive, you know, arena or anything, but he sold out, you know, a, a decent sized room, um, started doing the introductions at radio, started to do the press. That kind of filtered its way down through Europe, uh, started, you know, he popped at number three in, in Italy. Um, in France, it, you know, the song went all the way to number one, and then we ended up touring arenas. Um, you know, that was something that I kind of, now I look back at and I, I don't know for, uh, you know, at the time if I understood how vital the data was, but to me, that was a big point because it was something where I was like, all right, this is very clearly telling us that there is a pocket that's happening right. that we need to exploit and we need to, you know, we need to not exploit, I'm sorry, it's the wrong word, but you know, we need to, uh, expand from, and, and we were able to do that. So, you know, um. That's one, that I, I would say that's one kind of uh, inflection point, I guess, if, if you will, is, is just reading that data and then, and then acting on it. Um, and then others, I mean, I gave you, you know, the, um, the, the, the secondhand serenade story. Um, I worked with a band a while back um, called Bronze Radio Return, who, you know, we, we wound up doing a lot of big festivals, like all the, you know, all the big ones, basically, Lollapalooza, Firefly, uh, all that stuff. They, when I first met them, they were just starting out and, you know, I couldn't, I thought that they were tremendously talented, like live. Amazing. So, so good. They had a very unique sound. Great lead guy. Front guy was amazing. Is amazing. Um, for whatever reason, whether it was the sound or, or, or the times, I couldn't get a record label to sign them. And back mm -hmm. then it was like, oh, you need a label. You need a label. I couldn't do it. I, I just, I, I knocked on every door. We took a whole bunch of meetings. We showcased, we went, you know, we, we did the whole song and dance. Couldn't make it happen. But what we realized was, okay, you know what, if we're not going to, if we're not going to get, go the label route, let's figure out where our strengths are. Again, it's like the value play. Like where is the value for this band? And what I knew was they were great live and they were super sync heavy. Like their, their sound worked for that specific world. So I said, okay, great. Let's, you know, collectively, we, we, we decided let's focus on touring and let's focus on sync. So we went out there and stayed on the road for, you know, eight months, nine months out of the year. We put together um, a number of non-exclusive licensing deals. I basically went and found like each company that sort of specialized in something different. It's a little different now, but back then, like there was one company that was really good with trailers. There was another company that was really good with TV. There was another company that was really good in the advertising space. So like I kind of had all these non-exclusives. So we had right. all these different teams working the material without kind of really stepping on each other's toes. And what resulted from that was literally hundreds of sinks, uh, massive car commercials, um, Home Depot, uh, you know, like all these massive Starbucks, like they had so many big ads, so many movies, so many TV shows. It was like every week we had a, a new sync. So, you know, from an income uh, position, some people might look at that band and say, oh, well, they're not on the radio. I don't, you know, they can't be that big. But they were crushing it on the road and they right. were crushing it in the sync department. So, you know, that was a six piece band where everybody was able to leave the jobs and, you know, be full time happy touring musicians. Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, 
I guess kind of the, well, well, first of all, I kind of also want to, you know, point something out you said specifically in the Chris Cab uh, story, which is that you saw, uh, you saw a peak in the Netherlands and you investigated it. Um, and I think mm -hmm. in 2020, it's much easier to investigate it than, you know, in 1990, because you can reach those people a lot easier. Um, so I guess I just kind of wanted to point that out before we move forward that, you know, if something does exist like that in isolation, um, it's, it's, it's worth investigating and potentially changing your strategy for. I mean, I, I know, you know, Lau, for example, um, he became a pop star in a different country before he became a pop star in the U S and it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, when you, when you see those, when you see those peaks, um, in different, in different countries or in different cities, it does make sense to investigate those. And it'll be interesting to see now that everything is remote. I think it'll be a lot even more easier to do that. I think people are figuring out ways to, you know, maybe potentially geo target shows or, or things like that to actually represent those smaller markets and, and pay them uh, closer attention. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, but I guess before we like sign off here, Oh, no, you, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, I was just going to say you, you're right. There's so many tools now that weren't available um so you know from 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 a business standpoint you have the you know the chart metrics and the, the right. indifies and you know the all of those types of tools that are not just great a and r tools but also just great data tools um but even like spotify for artists or apple for right. artists like you can really you can really i mean like russ you know russ is one of our big tune core artists you know he's, he supports all the time russ you know basically came up with a plan of i'm just going to never open for anybody i'm just going to keep releasing music and wherever my streams are coming from wherever my sales are coming from i'm going to tour there and i'm going to headline even if it's 10 people mm. versus opening for somebody for a thousand people for you know a thousand cap room because i want to know that they're really my fans and then when i come back four months later it's going to be that much bigger and that much bigger and that plan led to him selling out the staple center on his own that's, with that's with, with with crazy. no openers, you know right. what I'm saying. So <laughs> that was a very data-driven plan that worked. Right. So yeah, you're right. And now with the texting, you know, the different um, the different texting platforms that exist, where you can actually, you know, text people within a radius of a city, you know, a week before a show, and say, "Hey, I'm coming to your town. Here's the ticket link." You know, I mean, that's amazing. That stuff didn't exist, you know, decades ago. Right. So exactly. Exactly. Um, so I guess before we sign off here, you know, you've had a, a fairly long career. We've obviously heard a lot of uh, really interesting stories from you, but what are some of the values that you attribute to uh, your longevity in the music industry? I think a lot of people um, don't get to necessarily stay in it for as long as you have for whatever reason. Um, you know, it's a very cutthroat industry. Um, so, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, values that you either came with that have stuck with you today or values that you built over your time in the music industry that have kind of helped uh, attribute your longevity? or a trip that you attribute to your longevity? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, I think for starters, uh, boiling it down to, to, to the, the bare basics, being a good human being is just so important. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I, I think I've made very, very few enemies in this business. Um, and that's because, you know, win, lose or draw again, people are human beings. So, you, you know, to, to lead with kindness is, is always, uh, the right, the right direction to take. So I don't think that, um, even in the instances where I would consider them, you know, losses or, or I've hit obstacles and, you know, butted heads with people, it's never been in a, in a majorly disrespectful way. So, um, I think, I think that that's the first thing is, is just being a good human and being, being right. like Daniel Glass told me, you know, um, many years ago, and it really stuck with me too. He, he said he would never sign an artist that he wouldn't have over for dinner. Mm. And, and I thought about that a lot because, you know, granted, not that I was an artist, but like, um, I think that that that's kind of the case, like in, in, in the, the whole business world, like you want to be surrounded by good people, right? Like that's another trait I looked for, like my staff, my staff, my team, I love those guys like, and, and, and girls, like they're just, they're just really good people. I think that that's really, really important. Um, and, and, and the company that we have is just, you know, made of good people. Um, and then, I, and then secondly, I think for me personally, um, not falling too heavy into trends, um, mm. you know, because trends kind of die. So, mm. you know, like, like I said, I started with secondhand serenade, who was an acoustic emo act. If I stayed in the acoustic emo world, my whole career, I wouldn't be, <laughs> you know, running a hip hop label. So, right. um, I think being able to stay nimble, uh, has, has helped a lot. 
Um, you know, like I said, I, I've worked with DJs. You know, uh, I managed Eric Marillo for a while. He was one of the biggest house DJs ever. Uh, I managed Teen Pop acts. I've managed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Richard Marks, who was a, a major singer songwriter from, uh, you know, the '90s and, and '80s, and then everything kind of in between, hip hop, R and B. So, so I think that that di diversity has uh, has helped me get to where. I am now, especially like, you know, I kind of laid out our strategy for these genre based right. labels that are, we're going to have. It would be really weird if I was only like just a hip hop head or if I was just into dance music, but like kind right. of overseeing this, you know, broader, uh, broader arm of the business. Um, so that's, that's been helpful. And then the last thing I think, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I'm a big believer that like everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, so I accept my losses just as much as my wins. They, they, they're almost equal to me. Um, and I know that had I not, you know, gone through ups and downs and peaks and valleys and held different roles and, um, seen all sides of the business that I wouldn't have the capacity to do what I do now. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, using those, using both wins and, and, and losses as building blocks versus, you know, the time to celebrate and the time to cry. There's no right. time for any of that stuff. It's just, you know, you use them all as, as building blocks. You, try to, you just try to turn one opportunity into another, into another, into another. And it's all a part of your story, right? So, like, if you, you, can't, you can't just attribute your successes to who you are today. You have to contribute to the entire context of your career, the wins and losses and everything. So, obviously, you know, there may be, you know, artists that you didn't like working with or there may be a campaign that failed miserably. But if you're proud of who you are today, then all of that was a stepping stone to, to today, you know. So, um a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Just, just, just remember that no matter who, you know, I mentioned it before, like I get hit up a lot on LinkedIn and people just want to jump on the phone and, and talk. And sometimes schedules don't really allow for it, but I try to say yes, as much as I can, because you just, you never know where people are going to be. You never know who, who is going to be some, you know, major executive right. or some, some brilliant marketing mind. I used to tell my interns that too. I'd be like, yo, I could be working for you soon. Like, you don't 100%, know that. <laughs> yeah. 100%. That is so true. And I, it's crazy how many people don't actually realize that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, even, but even on the flip side, even if, if you don't end up working for them, they will remember that you took their call when they were nobody. Like, they mm -hmm. will remember that you, you, you gave them some knowledge. You dropped some jewels on them when you didn't have to. They just asked for it and you said yes. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I think I just think that that's being a good a good human being, but those are the things that kind of come back around. Right, absolutely, mm -hmm. man. Well, well, thank you for uh, for virtually coming out, man. This was a great conversation. I think people have a lot to learn from this, so I uh, appreciate you taking the time out for sure. I appreciate you guys having me. Big fan of what you're doing. Absolutely. All right, catch you on the flip side, man. Be safe. Thank you, brother. Man, well, I really enjoyed talking to Chris. I think he has such a wealth of experience across the label side and management side and what he's up to with Pivotal, within TuneCore and some of the other kind of genre-specific labels they're getting ready to build. Really, uh, really fascinating from my perspective. So I'm really excited to see what they, they cook up and, and what's all in store for them. What do you think, man? Yeah, I think the way that they're approaching the, the label sphere in general um, and focusing on genre-specific labels and showing... Um, as, uh, you know, minute de getting into the minute details with their artists and really showing them personalized attention, I think is a, is a really interesting approach. Um, it's also interesting because, you know, like Chris said, he has a lot of experience with different genres in different, um, in different parts of the music industry. So he's actually in a, in a really good position to kind of lead that, to lead that front for the company. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what those different genre based labels look like um and it'll be interesting to see what the artists on those labels are like you know for, you know on pivotal projects for example they have mark e basie aside jazz cartier you know um and those are not small names so it'll be interesting to see how they balance the acts that have kind of been around for a little bit um with acts that they're bringing into the for, uh, forefront for the first time and you know i'm just excited to to see next steps and i'm glad that we got to speak with them there it is. Well, there you have it. Another week, another podcast in the books. Super grateful for your support. Uh, you'll hear us next week. Peace. Peace.